I'm Soda Lee and I have with me here Mr. Graham Green, guitar virtuoso. Welcome to West Coast Music Shack, Graham. It's great to have you here, mate. Thanks very much, Soda. It's good to be here. First of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate you on your Star Music Award. It's quite an achievement. Thank you very much. It was a, it was a big honour to win something all the way over there and, um, yeah, it was uh, yeah. quite chuffed. And bring it on home to little old Perth here. Yep, <laughs> indeed. Oh, excellent. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. But firstly, I'll ask you a couple of questions about your early career. Okay. Um, were you always musical? Then again, that's a silly question, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> uh, well, I always enjoyed music. My, I mean, my first experiences as a kid were like around mum's piano, mm. singing, singing songs with mum and her friends. So there was always music in the house. There, there weren't any performers as such because we grew up in, in a remote area in regional Australia. So it was all cattle stations and red dust, but there was, um, it was sort of like people had to make their own mm. entertainment. entertainment. There, was, there was no television, there was no commercial media as such. So there was the ABC radio, which had classical music and... BBC programming and uh, people made their own entertainment. So there's a piano and a ukulele, and it was always around. Outback Australia. <laughs> Outback Australia, up uh, the uh, the Kimberley region in Western Australia, yeah, which right. is all red dirt and cattle and kangaroos. Yes. And quite a famous location at the moment. Yeah, it is. They've gone up there and made a movie up there with uh, with some Australian actors, and mm. uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, my old stomping ground, so it's funny to see it on the silver screen. Yeah, oh, he's a dinky die. <laughs> <laughs> dinky die Aussie rocker. <laughs> um, how did you first um, find your way into the music industry? Uh, well, I... And kind of when did you turn pro? Yeah, well, I, uh, I left school and pretty much started playing in bands and, and pottering around. My, my first full-time gig, if you like, was in 1982. I was hired um, as a sideman to do a WA gig uh, touring with uh, a New Zealand artist called Kim Hart, and we um, toured right around Western Australia, and that was where I got my first taste of regular performing and, and doing things at a level, and um, uh, I felt right at home. It was hard work putting in all the miles, but um, enjoyed it immensely, mm. and that was, that was it for me. I pretty much knew that that's... Oh, yeah where I was headed. Yeah. A good life. Good it was fun. great. It was yeah. a great experience to have it um, at a professional level as an early exposure to it. So I sort of sussed <coughs> out that's, that's how it should be. And yeah. that was a yardstick for me when I had to look after myself. That's what I want to do and that's where yep. I can see I want to go, yeah. which you have. Indeed. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and your solo career, mm. uh, Kind of when and how did you decide it was time for you to turn into a band leader? Uh, well, I'd, I'd messed around with... Um, I'd always written songs and we'd recorded and performed stuff in, in the different bands I'd been in over the years. The Most notably, I guess, Flash Harry mm -hmm. and Ice Tiger were two bands that um, I'd written songs for. They were big in Perth. They were. Ice Tiger was great. We did an album um, mm -hmm. of... of uh, of songs that we'd that we'd written, and that was my my first experience as a producer, mm. and um, and uh, so I'd, I'd written songs and written music and over the years, but um, I'd had the instrumentals there, sort of as a just something that I did at home and messed around with, and the opportunity came when um, we were living in Sydney, Donna and I, and um, a fellow I was working for offered to put up the money to have me do a solo CD that yeah. he could promote in the shops, and so. Um, I recorded Blue Feathers, which was um, I my first I remember Blue solo Feathers. Yeah. yeah. I remember getting my first copy of it. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, the only time I'd done anything before that was uh, just before we moved to Sydney and we headlined the uh, West Australia Music Industry Awards at yeah. His Majesty's Theatre. Yeah, that and was a big night. That was my debut. As that was, I was terrified that I had a great band, I had ten fantastic musicians with me and playing in a theatre was a great yeah. experience and... Uh, and being around all my peers in the industry, and um, that uh, it was it was terrifying. But the the help of the people in the band, yeah. they all came along and just said yes, pool we'll do the gig. Yeah, pull rock resources, energy, and yeah, it was great to get that support from yeah. my friends and to do that gig was great. And and so I thought, yeah, it's um, Let something it I'd resonate. like to try. <laughs> it, was, it was great. It was uh, it was good. And since then, we've we've done um, other albums and. Uh, 
and uh, yeah, it's it's nice to be able to express your own voice. Yes, yes. Tell me about it. Mm. <laughs> Now your last album, Leap of Face, was recorded using all new guitars, including two new Graham Green Signature Series guitars. How did the Ormsby deal actually come about? Well, that came about at the end of 2004. We were doing the Ice Tiger reunion concerts, mm -hmm. and um, oh, Perry contacted me and uh, offered up his services as guitar technician for the gig, and which was great because I hadn't thought of that at all up to that point and um, he uh, asked as payment for doing that would I record an audio sample on a guitar that he'd made really? and up to this point I hadn't heard of Perry um, I met him he was a nice guy and uh, he did the gigs with me and um, then he brought this guitar around and it was a, um, a polka dot flying V a replica of Randy Rhodes guitar and um, not being a huge fan of flying V's, I thought, yeah, well, okay, you know, they're nice guitars, but not for me, and I'll play it anyway. And um, I put the guitar on, and the first thing I noticed was that it was perfectly balanced, which mm. for any guitar players, a flying V is almost always neck heavy and uh, uncomfortable to wear, for me anyway. And this guitar played beautifully, and it sounded great, and I did an audio sample for him, and then he brought me another guitar, a completely different sort of guitar, and I recorded with that for for him and um, by this time I was thinking this guy can build a guitar and we we became friends and I played more of his guitars and, and um, eventually um, the idea of building him building me a guitar came up and um, at the time I'd been talking with a, another company about perhaps doing a Graham Greene guitar and things weren't progressing terribly well and in the end Perry in fact sent me an SMS on my mobile phone and said I'll build you a guitar and um, he in fact built me two, a six string and a seven string and I used them to record on Leap of Face and um, as well as six other Ormsby guitars which were all completely different and they inspired, each one inspired a different tune Sure. and I finished off the recording with uh, my new guitars and um, it was the beginning of a great yeah. relationship. He he builds fantastic guitars, and yeah. um, I'm happy to play them. Never look back. Never look back. The guys the guys are genius, and I'm happy to play his instruments. And uh, it's a, sort of like every guitar player's dream to have someone go have here. Custom guitars. Here's some on. guitars. So yeah, yeah, you know you can't complain about it. It's uh, fabulous. They're great instruments, yeah, and uh, and uh, it's a great company to be involved with. Yeah, cool. Um, and you took these guitars with you to Vietnam last January with Resonance Project. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a bit about the band and the concert you played at in Hanoi. Right, well, um, back in 2005, um, Donna and I were going to head over to um, Vietnam and play some concerts to raise money for uh, a children's hospital in Vietnam uh, with a band we were in at the time. and. Uh, between one thing and another those plans fell through and we gave it no more thought and then I think it was at the towards the end of 2007 out of the blue we got a, an email from some people in Vietnam um, who were staging a concert in Hanoi in in the north and I uh, wanted to know if we would care to go over and um, of course. headline the foreign contingent if you like Fabulous for, opportunity. For this mm. it was great uh, it mm. came out of the blue but um, we thought that uh, it would be nice to present something that everyone could relate to, especially since um, you know we're <coughs> in a foreign land. And so we decided that we would present all vocal songs. Yeah, sure. And up to this point, with with my gigs anyway, we were playing mainly instrumentals, and Donna was getting up to sing a few songs through the night as features. And so we thought we'll put all of the vocal tracks together, and we'll go over, and we'll perform as a vocal group with Donna at the front. And it wasn't really Graham Greene and the Happy Sinners doing it like that. So we thought, well, for this, it's a big thing. Let's be a band. So we called it our Resonance Project. New beginning, so to speak. It was great. We we went over there. We played at uh, Median National Stadium, which is the the biggest Major venue, stadium. Sure. Yep, and uh, we had 15,000 people there. And uh, VTV, the Vietnamese television people, covered it. That went out live to six million people across wow. Southeast Asia.